Sunday is that special time for us to get together and study the Word of God. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning for our presentation of Give Me the Bible. So go get your Bible, sit down, and let's study together from the pages of God's eternal Word right here on Give Me the Bible. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Give Me the Bible. I'm Joe Hancock, and it's once again I'll be your host this morning as we look to God's Word for our guidance, our hope, and our eternal life as God has predicted it to be. I want to go this morning to the book of Revelation. It's not often that we uh, discuss the book of Revelation. It seems like a lot of folks are a little bit inhibited about uh, what's given in the book of Revelation. Is it future? Is it past? Is it history? Is it prophecy? Well, a little bit of all the above. Now, what I want to do is I want to go to Perry Cowan, and we're going to take about this, this look at the home that Jesus had talked about. In John 14, in verse 2, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am you may be also. Well, this brief view of those homes or those mansions or our heavenly home, our new home, is given to us in Revelation chapter 21, beginning down to verse 9. To set the scene just a little bit, we have in verse 9, uh, Then one of the seven angels who had seven bowls filled the seven last plagues came to me and talked to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. So our new home is referred to and described as the Lamb's wife. Then he carried me away, this is verse 10, he carried me away into the, into the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So, so John gets a view of our new home. Now we want to talk about this new home and what that means for us and what the, the book of Revelation in this particular chapter down through chapter t uh, 2, uh, or excuse me, chapter 22, uh, has to say to us. So we we'll go to Perry Cowan first and Perry begin the lesson for us if you would this morning. Good morning, folks. Thanks for tuning in. And please follow along in your Bible and search out the scriptures to see that the things that we teach you are indeed the truth. We strive to teach only the truth of God's Word. The, the picture that John saw and describes to us in the book of Revelation reveals that heaven is a, it's a splendid place. And I want to mention that splendor just a minute. There's a song that sometimes we sing, it, it, the lyrics go, I don't know exactly how sweet heaven will be. I don't know what beauty or what glory I'll see. I don't know what I'll behold that morning divine, but I know for sure that heaven's really going to shine. And shine it will. That's what the book of Revelation tells us about here in the 21st chapter and verse 11 because John revealed the words that an angel delivered to him there. He said, the angel showed me a holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Listen to it. Having the glory of God. What can be more splendid than that? What can be more beautiful than the glory of God? He said, it's radiance like a most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. What a splendid picture that puts in our mind. We need to consider what heaven's going to be like. Heaven shines with the very glory of God, and God's glory and man's presence will dwell there together if we are uh, among those who are saved because we have done the will of our, our God. The precious stones and the metals that John mentions in his description, there are many. He talks about jasper and crisper and uh, uh, crystal and sapphire and emeralds and onyx and topaz and amethyst and pearls, and there's many, many others. Uh, I, I suggest that he uses those precious metals and precious stones uh, just to help us to form a picture of this awe-inspiring place, a beauty that surpasses the beauty of anything that we have ever seen or even imagined. Uh, I don't know that we'll ever behold uh, the, the glory of heaven until we cross over into that realm. 
the book of Revelation said that it had a great high wall with 12 gates and the gates uh, at the gates 12 angels and on the gates the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. On the east there were three gates, the north three gates, the west three gates, the south three gates, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the name of the apostles of the Lamb. Walls are constructed to keep things in or to keep things out or maybe to direct people to the area where they are to enter in. We need to enter in by the way of the gate. And that gate, according to John chapter 14 and verse 6, is Jesus Christ. Joe? You know, we, I, while you were talking, I was thinking about a song we sing in the congregation in Hallsville, How Beautiful Heaven Must Be. And this description that uh, Perry has read for us uh, from Revelation 21 is, is, is a verification of that fact, how beautiful it really must be. And one of these days, we do as we should, if we're the Christians we ought to be, if we're found pleasing to God, if we pass through the judgment, we'll get to know just exactly how beautiful it really, really is. I want to go to Jerry Munhottle now. Jerry, talk to, us, talk to us about the size of the city that John saw. Well, thank you, Joe. I think it's important whenever John is trying to put into physical terms that which is not physical when he was talking about heaven and talking about the beauty of heaven, one of the things he'd use to describe the beauty of heaven is the sheer size of this city that we're talking about. Let's look in Revelation 21 verses 15 through 17. And he talked with me and had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof and the city lieth four square and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. And length and breadth and the height are all equal. And he measured the wall thereof, 140 cubits, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, uh, of the angel. And so he's just talking about the sheer size of it as he's trying to uh, tell us what heaven is like in physical terms. You know, a few years ago, uh, my wife and I went to visit the, on vacation and went to visit the Grand Canyon. And as we were telling people we're going to visit the Grand Canyon, they would say, oh, we've been there and you've got to see this and you've got to see that. And they were trying to describe the Grand Canyon to us. And they would describe its beauty and they would describe the size of the Grand Canyon. But you cannot describe it and you cannot really relate and, to it until you see it. And once you're there, you just are still in awe, even though you've been told about it and you've seen pictures about it and such, and, and people have tried to, in their own words, describe it. Until you've been there, you really can't appreciate the Grand Canyon and its size. I think the same way with heaven. We can't really appreciate it until we're there. Now, John uses physical terms in describing it, and and certainly, and physically, it'd be about 1,500 miles square, maybe a cube or a pyramid or a spear. Uh, its diameter would be larger than the moon. If it was set along the east coast, it would stretch from the Atlantic to the Mississippi and from the Canadian border to the Gulf of Mexico. The wall would stand about 216 feet high. Uh, and so, in physical terms, it's awesome. And I think that's what John is describing. Just an awesome place to be. We're going to talk about its beauty as later on as some panelists come up. I just wanted to just talk about the size. It's overwhelming in size in physical terms. We know it's not a physical place. It's a spiritual place. But John is just trying to tell us, trying to whet our appetite just a little bit. Oh, I want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven and I want to take as many people as possible. When Paul wrote these words, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Don't you want to go to heaven? Come and go with us. Now back to you, Joe. Jerry, thank you very much for your part of the program this morning. And, and I, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, I want to go. I want to take as many with me as I can. In fact, I don't know, Jerry, if we can get to heaven if we don't take quite a few folks with us. That's our duty. And that's our, that's our calling and our task. I want to go to, uh, to Buddy Ray now. Buddy, uh, what about the uh, substance of this city that John has seen? I want to add to what's been said earlier by Jerry, especially as he mentioned there at the end, as I think about heaven, I'm comforted by those words that say, here on this earth I have not seen anything like heaven. 
I've not heard about anything like heaven, and certainly I can't imagine the beauty that God has prepared for me and laid up for me. And in verses 18 through 21 in Revelation chapter 21, we see a description he once again gives that we might understand to put it in to the colors or things that we might can relate to and see when he describes the beauty of this city and the wall around it. It says that the wall is clear jasper. The city itself is pure gold and pure gold that is transparent. And in verses 19 and 20, he talks about the foundations, which are the 12 stones that are set in the wall. And if you look at some of them as he talks about the jasper being clear and the sapphire being clear blue, he goes on to mention several others such as emerald, which is deep green, sardonyx, white with layers of red. I want you to do something this morning, and I want you to close your eyes and just imagine the blending of all these beautiful things and the way things he describes to us that we can understand. And as Jerry said, he describes this place called heaven. He goes on to talk about sardius, which is fiery red, the beryl, which is sea green, and topaz, the greenish yellow, the amethyst, which is purple. And he looks at all of these things and he blends them together. And these precious stones whereupon the apostles' names are written are the foundation to the wall. How beautiful heaven must be, as has been mentioned. We so often sing about heaven and we think about the grace of God that he saves us through that grace and allows us to yearn for that home in heaven. But if you have your Bible open, I want you to move back up just a little bit higher into Revelation chapter 21. And some of my favorite scripture comes from there and also the description of heaven when it says that there's going to be no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more crying. You look at all of these things that we suffer here on earth and that we go through here on earth, they're going to be removed from us at heaven, and it says it's because the former things have passed away. I want you to think about the beautiful colors and descriptiveness of this city and of this wall, but I want you to also think about all the trials and the tribulations of this world being gone that make it so beautiful. And in that verse in Revelation chapter 21, it says, Behold, all things have been made new. I ask you this question this morning. Have you been baptized into Christ, into his death, and risen just as Christ did from his death? Have you put on Christ in baptism in order? that you might become a new creation and live life in such a way that in heaven all things will be made new. Back to you, Joe. Buddy, thank you, sir. Thank you for being here on the program this morning. We appreciate your input. Uh, folks, uh, there's, there's to me a, a brilliance that's being described here, uh, brilliance of this new heavens, the, the new city, the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And I want to get Dan Manuel to, uh, to be our next panelist and to, to talk to us about this brilliance that we're seeing here. Dan? Joe, I'll be happy to do that. You know, heaven is going to be such a wonderful place as has already been described. It's uh, enough to make me want to be there, uh, to be in the presence of God. And, you know, the Bible says that when Christ comes again, he's coming in the brightness of his coming. Christ himself will be in heaven. The Bible says that we won't need the sun nor the moon, for the sun, that is the S-O-N, shall be the light thereof. We know that Christ is referred to as the bright and the morning star. It's the first star that we see at night and the last star in the morning. How thankful today that we're going to go to a place where there is no outer darkness. You know, in contrast to heaven, hell is described simply as the place of outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But to the contrary, heaven is going to be that brilliant place where we long for. Uh, you know, light is a wonderful thing. Light does a lot of things, doesn't it? Light here this morning brightens up a lot of things around here. We wouldn't be able to come to you this morning had it not been for the light in this room. But aren't we thankful today that in heaven we won't need the sun or the moon anymore? And we will look upon the brightness of our Father in heaven. 
You know, no one has seen God at any time. Even Moses himself, when he climbed up the mountain, received the law of God. He had to turn away his face from the brightness of the one who we call the creator of the universe, even the almighty God. But in his brilliance in heaven, we will see him. And we will praise him and we will honor him. And we will be able to live with the redeemed from all the ages of time in that beautiful city of light. We call it the city that lies four square, but I like to refer to it as the city of light. You know, a lot of people refer to various cities as the city of lights. People call Las Vegas the city of, of lights. <laughs> but I want to tell you that the real city of light is heaven itself. And it is a place where you can go. It's a place where you can dwell when life is over here for you. And I hope that you're prepared uh, and made ready for that celestial city. It is a wonderful place. And I hope this morning that if you're not a Christian, you would become obedient to Christ. Let him light up your life. And then when life is over, to be with him forever and ever in that city of light. Joe. Folks, you know, we last week on this program, we talked about the fact that, that we're all going to pass away one of these days. We don't know when that's going to be. And even possibly the Lord would return first in our lifetime before we ever do die. And when that time comes, as our panelists have explained this morning, there lies that new home, that, that new city, the, the bride, the wife, the wife of the lamb that we look forward to, but only if we're found pleasing to God when we stand in judgment. Now, in this new city, this, this vision we see from John, uh, we're going to get Barry Haynes to talk to us about the superiority of what John has to say, beginning at around verse 22. You know, I have a friend, she is a real estate agent in the Oklahoma City area, and she was talking to me a while back and saying about how hot the market is, of how easy it is to sell houses, because everyone wants one. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those times when, when everybody's looking. You know, but most of the time in real estate, it's all about location, right? Location, location, location. Because you want to be good in good school district. You want to be uh, near the amenities that you want. You want to be able to go to restaurants, things like that. That's what you're looking for. You know, when heaven is described, it tells us about something that is not in there that would normally one would expect. It says, I saw no temple in it for the Lord God Almighty and its Lamb of the temple. It's interesting there was no temple. But why is it saying that? It's saying that because you went to the temple to be in a place where you could approach God. But that's what's different in heaven. God is there and he's everywhere. You know, I recently read about a man who put a, a home movie theater in his house. He had the seats and the projector and he, he, he loved it because he said, you know, I don't have to go to the movies because the movies is in my home. Well, in essence, we will not have to go to worship God because God will be there among us. See, heaven is perfectly made for God. It says there that the city has no need of sun of lamp to shine as Dan talked about. Why? Because the light doesn't come from without, it comes from within. Because God is there and all that is good and light is there that illuminates that city. And the nature of the city is its approachableness. You see, the, the city, as it says, it says, The nations will walk by his light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, the gates will never be closed and they will bring glory and honor into the nations among them. It's interesting here because it talks about how the kings bring their glory and all the things of the nations. You know, sometimes you'll hear people mark that, well, if this isn't heaven, isn't in heaven, well, I, I don't want to go there. You know, of course, that's a, a, probably a very glib way to think about it because whatever's going to be in heaven is going to be far greater. But this passage does tell us that everything that's good here will be there. In the sense that, that everything that God has created, the beauty and the wonders of it, it will be in heaven. And heaven will be a place that there will be no need for security. You know, a gate of a city was, was a twofold trap. One, it brought things into the city. It was the, the means of tra uh, to travel, but it also was the weakest point of the city. And in times of danger, you need to close those gates to keep things out of it. But notice here, the gates never close. That means the city is always open. There is no security concerns. There's no worry. People will come to worship God and they'll bring their honor and glory and their offerings to him. Those gates will never be closed. You know, we've experienced that, a time where we couldn't go to worship together because the, the doors were closed, but that will never be the case in heaven. We will always be there with God 
always ready to worship him and always ready to experience the glory and the beauty that's in his presence. Barry, thank you so much, brother. Uh, thank you for being on the program this morning. And, you know, I've got just a little bit of time left here. I want to go to one more of our panelists. I want to go to Chris Grota. And, and, and Chris, in, in all this, what we've heard this morning from the other panelists, is there's an appeal here. Uh, and it should be an appeal to everyone who reads this passage uh, from, from Revelation 21 and 22 both. But, but talk to us about this appeal and, and what that really, really means. Very well, Joe. And thank you all for watching this morning. Here's the appeal. In heaven, in Revelation 21, 27, nobody who's unclean, nobody who does anything detestable or false will be there. Only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, that's, that's the first thing that we look at. You skip over to the next chapter in chapter uh, 22 and look at verse number 4, and you'll see the wonder of heaven there. The Bible says they will see his face. Nobody's ever seen the face of God. Moses, who got to see the backside of God, the hinder parts, Exodus 33, 23, is going to see the face of God. And, and if you think about how privileged he was and how much he probably was thinking, man, I just can't wait to see what his face looks like. We all are going to get to see what his face looks like. Well, that's, that's whetting the appetite of the Christian right there, friends. Look at verse number 5. The light of heaven is God himself. Notice it says here, and there will be no more night. They will not have a need of a lamp. The light of lamp is not needed there or the sun, for the Lord himself will be their light. This echoes the same sentiment as in Revelation 21, 23, where the city has no need of the sun or the moon, for the glory of God illuminated it. Uh, the Lamb is its light. And so we're going to live in the light of the living Lamb of God, which took away the sin of this world. That is tantalizing. It is, it is wetting our appetite. We're going to see this. We're going to behold this. And then, of course, he says in the last part of verse number 25 that there we will reign forever. See, the bride and the Lamb await the consummation. And that's, that's going to heaven, friends. That's what that's all about. And, and the bride will reign with her husband, the Lord Jesus Christ, Heaven's sounding sweeter all the time. In his song, Rufus Cornelius wrote, Oh, I want to see him look upon his face. He said, When in service for my Lord, dark may be the night, but I'll cling more close to him. He will give me light. Satan's snares may vex my soul, turn my thoughts aside, but the Lord goes ahead, leads where air be tied. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face there to sing forever of His saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. Dear friends, are you prepared for heaven? Back to you, Joe. Great question, Chris, and, and it's an honest question. It's, it's one we all have to take uh, stock of, and, and Paul writes in, in uh, multiple places in the Scripture in the New Testament, examine yourselves. Uh, we're go there's going to be an examination one day that we're all going to have to forgo, and that examination is when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and we stand accountable for the things we've done, the things we've not done, the things we forgot to do or, or didn't want to do. The actions of our lives, each and every one of us, we'll be accountable for those. Now, if, if, if we pass the judgment, in other words, if we're found pleasing to God, if we're found spotless and blameless, which is only in Christ Jesus, then the city that's been talked about this morning will be ours for eternity. And I pray and I hope that your, your spotlessness, your cleanness will be found to be yours at the judgment. But you can only do that in Christ Jesus. Only those found faithful in Christ have access to heaven to be with God for all of eternity, to worship and praise and sing to Him as our King, our God, and our Deliverer. Friend, if you've not ever obeyed the gospel, please consider doing that as soon as you can. Contact one of the churches of Christ in your area. Talk to one of the elders or the preacher or the deacons. Study with them to understand what it means for you to be found faithful in Christ. And beyond that, we hope to see you here next week right here on Give Me the Bible as we go to God's Word once more. God bless and thanks for being here today.
Sing the sweetest song of all. 